as you're seeing this, I'm on vacation overseas, so this is off topic, but let me know your favorite vacation spot in the comments below. But getting back on topic today, we're going to be talking about our top 10 small forwards in the NBA going into next season, continuing this uh, six-part series. Kicking off here with some honorable mentions, we'll talk about criteria in just a moment. But these are some guys that could easily be on the list. If you want to argue from 8 to 15, all these guys are interchangeable. So some guys that I, I think deserve their flowers. Michael Porter Jr., of course, had his best season last year. Franz Wagner has been killing it over there for Team Germany. J-Dub for the Thunder. And uh, the combination there in New York, of course, with Josh Hart and OG Ananobi. I think maybe if the Knicks decide to go with a Julius Randle and Mitchell Robinson front court, then OG would be playing the three with Mikhail at the two. You guys get the picture. So two small forwards there in New York. But the one guy that isn't necessarily the best guy that I left off the list, but from last year's list to this year's list, he did fall off the list was Chris Middleton. Uh, Chris Middleton, of course, uh, subpar season, I'll say, and I know he dealt with some injuries. But in the postseason, I mean, that uh, playoff run alone from Chris Middleton could have easily saved him on this list. He had that one crazy game against Indiana where uh, he had that, you know, 40-point game and he had that crazy three that sent him to overtime, and then they almost won it in overtime. Chris Middleton, of course, great postseason. He's still a very solid player. I just don't think he's top 10 any more. But I think the, the best player that's probably not on the list is OG Ananobi. So if you want to have him on the list, of course, that is uh, no problem for me. But getting into the criteria before, of course, you see the name on your list. Uh, basically, what have you done for me lately? In the last year and a half, two years, uh, how good have you been? What you know? What's your skill set? Uh, you know, how many big moments have you had? I take into account your team situation, uh, your individual moments, your stats, basically everything over the last year and a half or so. And then outside of that, the positions are based on my projections for these lineups for every team going into next season. So if you have any questions, for example, why is Desmond Bain a three and not a two? Let me know in the comments. Of course, I just project Desmond Bain will be the two with Marcus Smart in the backcourt with Ja Morant. So hopefully that makes sense. But let's get into it here. Desmond Bain at the three, and he is at number 10 on my list for small forwards last year. It was a it was a mess there in Memphis, of course, no pun intended. But Marcus Smart got traded there before the season. He had an okay season, uh, of course, some individual moments from him, but not a great overall year. Jaron Jackson, you know, had a, a, an okay overall year, but everyone on this team seemingly dealt with injuries at some point in the season, and this team was never fully healthy. And on top of all of that, John Moran had his incidents off the court on Instagram Live, so he was suspended. The majority of the season, but when he came back for those eight games, Memphis was much watched TV, uh, which we talked about on Monday. I'm still a big fan of John Morant, uh, or at least I'm now a big fan of John Morant and this Grizzlies team going into next season. I think they can contend for a title, but if that's the case, we need this version of Desmond Bain. Desmond Bain was uh, one of the few steady pieces for Memphis all year last year, and he was giving them 24, four and a half, and five and a half a night. I understand they didn't win a lot of games, and that's why he's at number 10. But if we get this version of Desmond Bain, <laughs> this team is going to be contending for a title. But he's going to provide this team with lead spacing next year when John Morant returns. Uh, good defense, maybe above average defense on the wing. He's shooting almost 40% from three on a lot of volume, keep in mind. But Desmond Bain, I think, is maybe the most underrated wing in the league as far as his value uh, or, or how we rank him. But that is just my opinion. I think Desmond Bain is a tremendous player. He's going to play a huge part on a contending team next season. And again, you see his stats. They speak for themselves. At number nine, it might seem like a shock. And you're probably sitting there saying, there is no way that Brandon Ingram is the ninth best small forward in the league. And I understand. But let me explain before you guys click off the video. But Brandon Ingram moves down a couple spots here from last year's list to this year's list. This is a guy that just ended the season on such a sour note, at least in all of our eyes. This is a guy that, sure, you know, he, he dealt with some injuries, but he came back with a couple weeks left before the play-in. And then in, in those couple weeks, and then in the play-in, he was subpar. So he said, okay, 
you, you just came back from injury. You know, Zion is, is playing on a different planet right now. So we understand why you're getting off to a slow start. But then going into the playoffs, there's no Zion Williamson. You are looked at to be the go-to bucket getter, the go-to guy against an Oklahoma City Thunder team that is super young. And Brandon Ingram, let's just say, he didn't even give us one moment. He didn't give us one game in that series where it was like, okay, this Pelicans team, they can make it interesting because they have Brandon Ingram leading the ship. And he is just an unstoppable bucket getter. But we didn't get that. And, and, and in fact, he struggled the entire series. And I talked about it with C.J. McCullough. The best two players in that series for the Pelicans were Jonas Valanciunas and Trey Murphy. It shouldn't be that way. Even though Trey Murphy and, and, and Herb Jones are tremendous players, and Jonas is, is, is a solid player as well, it should be the go-to guys. It should be C.J., Brandon Ingram, and Zion. But Zion was hurt, and we didn't get anything out of C.J. and Brandon Ingram in that first-round series or even in the play-in. Uh, so, again, the way he ended the season definitely left a sour taste in my mouth. But please don't twist my words. He's still a tremendous uh, score with the basketball. He has his moments. We just want it to be more consistent in the bigger moments. And that's all I'm getting at here with Brandon Ingram. So he drops one spot, but still, again, great score. Uh, just not as consistent in the defense isn't as great as some other players on this list. Most notably, maybe not most notably, but a, a guy that I think uh, is heavily underrated as well in that conversation with Desmond Bain is Laurie Markkinen. Laurie Markkinen is, on I think, not only on paper, but I think on the court is actually better than Brandon Ingram Going into next season, might sound crazy, but this is a guy that is just like Brandon Ingram, where he's occasionally going to be that go-to scorer on a nightly basis. Some nights, he might only give you 12 points. The other nights, he might pop off for 30. But Laurie Markkinen's giving you just about 23 and a half points a game, elite rebounding, 8, eight to 10 rebounds a game. He's giving you elite rim protection as well while also shooting better from the field than Brandon Ingram. So uh, both teams, of course, not necessarily contenders. Right, both teams not necessarily, uh, you know, great teams. However, Larry Markkinen is in a similar situation where he's not a go-to guy, but he occasionally can be, just like Brandon Ingram. But he gives us those other traits that uh, pushes them over Brandon Ingram in my eyes. But Larry Markkinen, knockdown shooter, again, occasional go-to score, but great, uh, better defender than Brandon Ingram, and I think that's what pushes him over the top. So. Laurie Markkinen at number eight. Let me know what you think in the comments. Might be a hot take, but I think going into next year, Laurie is one spot better. At number seven, we have Debo DeMar DeRozan, a guy that two years ago, it looked like, you know, on that Bulls team that got eliminated in the play-in, we said, okay, that, that's that's the last straw. This team's finally going to tail off, uh, especially when, once we heard the news that Lonzo wasn't going to play last season. We said, okay, this team's going to finally tail off DeMar. He's getting older. He's not the same player that he once was. But then he proved us wrong. <laughs> DeMar DeRozan came in the last year and played maybe his best season as a Chicago Bull, as crazy as that might sound. 24, four and a half, five and a half a night on good efficiency for DeMar DeRozan's volume. Um, this is a guy that last year proved that on a nightly basis, he could still be a go-to guy on a on a play-in, playoff level team. And now he's in a new situation. He wanted to contend at least one more time in his career. And I think at least for the next year or two, he can do that in Sacramento. As this Sacramento team is going to be fun. And they're going to be special. Because once I heard the news that DeMar DeRozan was signed and traded to Sacramento, I worried that it was going to be for Keegan Murray. But the Sacramento Kings were able to keep Keegan Murray. So now you have three mid-range killers in, De in DeBonta Sabonis, De'Aaron Fox, and uh, DeMar DeRozan. So I do worry about the spacing, but the saving grace here is the fact that Keon Ellis has approved his three-point shot over the last year or so. And then, of course, you also have Keegan Murray, who has the best crowd chant in the league, but also, of course, a knockdown shooter from outside the arc. I worry about the other spacing options on the Sacramento Kings team, but I do know that DeMar DeRozan is going into this situation in Sacramento where he can be their go-to scorer on a nightly basis. And, you know, if that's the case, you just need guys like De'Aaron Fox to consistently make his three-pointers like he was last season and Sabonis to bounce back a little bit as far as his jump shot, which kind of tailed off last year. Um, but if that's the case, DeMar DeRozan at 34, he still might have his best contention basketball ahead of him. <laughs> as crazy as that might sound, his best chance at a ring ahead of him uh, outside of those years with LeBron James. 
But that's that's it. Now, number number seven for DeMar DeRozan drops a spot, not because he's a bad player, not because he got worse, but the small forwards are just as stacked as the point guard position. And that can be seen here because Paul George is not even a top five small forward in the league anymore. As crazy as that might sound, <laughs> we're getting old, man. Uh, but of course, another guy that is in a new situation there in Philadelphia, it was the summer of Paul George. And he landed, of course, in the city of brotherly love. But 22 and a half points a game, five rebounds, three and a half assists. He's now in a situation where him and Tyrese Maxey can be that 2A, 2B go-to scorer on a nightly basis. Where if Maxey has it going, because we know MB is going to drop 30 a night. If Maxey has it going, I don't. I, I could just focus solely on the defensive end and do the little things to help us get over the top. And same for if Paul George has it going. Tyrese can just focus on facilitating a defense and let Paul George and Embiid take a, take the team over the top. Um, or, you know, or of course, if both of them don't have it going, what if Kelly Oubre has a night? There, there might not be a team deeper than the Philadelphia 76ers, uh, maybe outside of the Boston Celtics, uh, because they have quality depth, of course. But this, this, this Sixers team is going to be fun to watch next year. And I think in order to beat the Boston Celtics in a seven-game series, I've mentioned it, you need that dominant big man. Whether if it's Jokic, whether if it's Giannis or Joel Embiid, if you don't have one of those dominant big men, I can't really see you beating Boston in a seven-game series. So with that in mind, of course, I think Philly can actually knock off Boston in the playoffs next year, even though Embiid hasn't proven to be a great playoff performer. But in order for that to happen, guys like Tyrese Maxey and guys like Paul George also need to step up, even though he's 34, even though he's going to be kind of in a backup role. I expect Paul George to come out with a chip on his shoulder and to have a great season. Uh, now, this list isn't based off potential, uh, but that is just, of course, my outlook going into next season for Paul George in his role with Philadelphia. But uh, again, still a, a great two-way player, still a go-to scorer on some nights. And he's one of the one of the smoothest players and one of one of the uh, I guess most eye uh, eye appealing players to watch. <laughs> you guys get what I'm trying to say here. He's fun to watch. He's kind of like Kyrie, where you, you tune in for Paul George is what I'm getting at here. But moving into the top five, let's talk about Kawhi Leonard. And if you ask me, even even last year because I had struggles ranking Kawhi Leonard, this came down to health. And really, if you want to dive into it, you know, this past year. He played the most games in a long time, so I couldn't really come up with that argument. But at the same time, when it came down to when it mattered the most, he wasn't there for his team. And when you're in the same tier of player as the four guys above you, I got to give the advantage to the guys that were above you, and they were healthy when it mattered most outside of maybe one guy in the, in the top four. But Kawhi Leonard, this season, when he played a lot of games, by the way, 24 points, six rebounds, three and a half assists, this is a guy that tried to make a return to the court. Of course, injuries are not his fault. He tried to make a return in the playoff series, but only really hurt his team more so than helped it. But Kawhi Leonard, again, one of the best players in the 2010s. He's going to go down probably as a top three player in that decade. Uh, maybe you can argue it's Steph Curry or Kawhi Leonard, uh, but he's going to be top four in one of the best decades of basketball ever. He's going to be a Hall of Fame player, elite two-way player when he's healthy. But that's the problem, right? Can you can you rely on your star player to be healthy in the playoffs when it matters the most? And for that reason, that's why I have him at number five, especially, again, there's players on this list that have done more in the last year and a half, two years, than Kawhi Leonard, which is why he falls down the list a little bit more. But if we're talking about careers, he's in the top three of this list because we all know who's, who, who the top two are, even in 2024. At number four, we have the reigning finals MVP, Jalen Brown, the reigning Eastern Conference finals MVP as well. A guy that in my eyes was the most snubbed player from Team USA because of his recent success and dominance. And if you're looking for play style, Jalen Brown does all of what Derek White does, but plus some uh, to a higher degree. Regardless, Jalen Brown at number four should be on Team USA. But at 27 years old, he's only entering his prime, it seems like, in his career uh, this is a guy that was looked at to just be a Robin for this stacked Boston Celtics team. But boy, did it look like it was a team solely built around Jalen Brown at some times because he would just take over, whether if it was in certain regular season games or, of course, the playoffs most notably. He would just take over sometimes, and, and it looked like it was Jalen Brown's team. And that's what I keep pointing back to is if you're a first-time basketball fan tuning into the NBA Finals to see 
I heard Luca's pretty good. Let me, you know, I know Boston's a great franchise. Let me tune into the finals. You would walk away from that final saying Jalen Brown is the best players wearing green and white uh, after last season, right? Uh, so Jalen Brown, he steps up more so probably than Jason Tatum in some moments. But I will give Jason Tatum some some love next week, and we'll talk about that. I understand Jason Tatum took a, a little bit of a backseat role when he needed to. But still, reigning finals MVP, reigning Eastern Conference finals MVP, Jalen Brown is a tremendous two-way player. Gives you all NBA effort on both ends of the court. And number three is Jimmy Butler. Is he too high? Should Jalen Brown be over him? Should Kawhi Leonard be over him? Those guys are definitely in uh, the same tier of players. So keep that in mind. Some of these guys are interchangeable. But Jimmy Butler technically moves up a spot. Uh, again, it's just because some positions change from year after year. But Jimmy Butler, still a great season last year. Uh, you know, I know he's not a great regular season player, but that's not why he's here. Two years ago, this is a guy that led the number eight seed to the NBA Finals. First time that's ever happened uh, outside of the 99 Knicks. Um, first time it's happened in a while. Let's put it that way, right? But Jimmy Butler is such a tremendous playoff player. We know he turns that switch when he needs to. But this past year, he got hurt in the play-in, and that just wasn't his fault. His team still made the playoffs. But if he, you know, there was a small, <laughs> there was a small belief in all of our minds that if this team made the playoffs against Boston, uh, at the bare minimum, it would have been like a six-game series. Uh, but Jimmy Butler, again, he's here because of his playoff. We know what he can do in the playoffs. And when it, he's in the playoff mode, when he's playoff Jimmy, this is a guy that looks like a top five player in the world on a nightly basis. At number two, LeBron James. And this is the first time I will admit he's probably not the best in his position anymore. At 39 years old, he's still giving us typical LeBron James number. This dude was made in a factory and he isolates himself like Wolverine in the off seasons. But this is a guy that 39 years old continues to evolve his game. And I understand his his body um, <laughs> is not the same what it used to be as far as the physicality. And in fact, I'm recording this a lot earlier. So uh, by the time I'm recording this, he just dropped uh, like the last 11 points in the, the last exhibition game against South Sudan. So when this dude wants to turn it, turn on that killer instinct uh, to flip the switch and say, give me the ball and get out the way, he can still do that. So LeBron James... Um, still an amazing player at 39. I just don't think he's better than the one guy above him, finally, right? But at 39, continues to uh, evolve his game. He's he's just shot his career high from the three-point line this past season. And going into next year, this Lakers team at the moment has still not traded D'Angelo Russell. So it looks like they're just going to run it back with the same squad for the most part and just hope that this depth is enough to get over the Denver Nuggets, <laughs> seemingly. Seemingly, as long as they can get over Denver, uh, this team might be able to make a run. But at number one, Kevin Durant, a guy that has been number two to LeBron James for such a long time, uh, and he was for the majority of their primes. But Kevin Durant, I think at this point, it's safe to say, is a better basketball player than LeBron James, or at least better at what he does than LeBron James's package. But uh, Kevin Durant, uh, 27 points tonight, six and a half rebounds, five assists, and this is coming from a Cavs fan, so... Um, I don't really want to put KD over LeBron James. I want to have LeBron James as the number one player in the league still. But at the end of the day, I keep these lists as not objective as possible. Kevin Durant is still maybe the best go-to scorer in the league. As crazy as that might sound. But this is the guy that was underutilized for the majority of last season. There was times when he was just a corner sitter. Can you imagine Kevin Durant being a corner sitter? He might be the one guy where you say, your life's on the line. You need a bucket. Who are you going to? And that's Kevin Durant, probably eight, eight, eight out of ten times for most people. He's a, he, We've never seen anything like him. Well, I don't think we'll ever see anything like him as far as his fluidity. Wemby, of course, has an argument, but he's not as fluid as a guy like Kevin Durant. He's not as agile as a guy like Kevin Durant. We won't probably see something like him for a long time. But Kevin Durant, I think, just with his scoring ability, we know what he can do, and we know he can still take over games. If he wasn't so great last season next to Devin Booker, it's hard to think that that Suns team even gets to the sixth seed uh, after that second half stretch that these star players went on. Uh, but to me, he is the number one small forward at this point in time. Here's a quick recap of everything. Of course, top five, we have KD, Braun, Jimmy Butler, Jalen Brown, and Kawhi Leonard. Six through ten is Paul George, DeMar DeRozan, Laurie Markkinen, who moves up two spots. Uh, Brandon Ingram and Desmond Bain. Of course, the two honorable mentions behind my screen are Michael Porter and Chris Middleton. 
but we also have Franz, J-Dub, and OG and OB slash Josh Hart. What I want to do here before we close off today's episode, I want to do, I, I did this for the point guards and of course for the shooting guards as well. I like to look at some of the people that were left off the list and I want to predict the player that's going to make the biggest jump at this position next season. Who can jump into this list potentially uh, this time next season? So should be tons of fun. Of course, Franz Wagner is a great name that could be thrown on this list. I can easily see him getting, uh, you know, make making that big jump. Uh, Michael Porter, if he continues to play as good as he did last year, being really the second best player for the Nuggets, he can make that jump. Of course, OG and Anobi as well. But I'm going to go with Jalen Williams, J-Dub there. Of course, this is his rookie photo. But being that such, being such a dynamic player for the Thunder, a guy that really had maybe the biggest breakout for them this past season, being that secondary ball create, or ball handler and shot creator, uh, really making this team unguardable because most teams were like, okay, we're just going to double uh, shade or shade over to his side. But then Jada really evolved his game and turned into this score that can give you 25 to 30 a night uh, in the playoffs, right, when it matters most. So teams couldn't double or they couldn't shade a certain way. It really made this, this Thunder team a headache to guard for the Pelicans, who have a lot of great wing defenders, and for the Dallas Mavericks, who if the Mavericks just didn't have the excellence of Luka Doncic, the Thunder would have been in the Western Conference Finals as the youngest team in basketball, which is another point that I can go to. Being so young and being so dominant is impressive in its own right. So Jalen Williams, I think, can make that big jump. I think the Thunder will compete for a title next season. And as long as this team can make it to like the Western Conference Finals, I, I can see J-Dub having a huge impact for that to happen. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, I, I think he can make this list this time next season but let me know your predictions down in the comments on this day in nba history august 6th of course i like to look at uh time to time i like to look throughout nba history always good to refresh our memories and uh as fate would have it we have a player that just went to we have some news about the sixers and then a player that just went to the sixers but also a, a historical moment in his career as well when we look back to 1962 you see it in the top left of your screen the Philadelphia franchise changed their name from the Nationals, uh, of course, like the, the baseball team, the Washington Nationals, to the 76ers. So, uh, of course, big change there as, as when they were the Nationals, they had guys like Will back in the day. And now uh, it's been a long time since then. And then in 2016, Paul George returned to Team USA after that devastating knee injury. And, of course, he played for the Rio Olympics. He didn't play much. He didn't play a lot of minutes, but... For that to be his first basketball back since his big Olympic injury, uh, it was great to see for Paul George. And, of course, he would go on to continue to be an MVP candidate there in uh, uh, Oklahoma City. Excuse me. And then, of course, being a great player for the Clippers down the line. But Paul George, as fate would have it, is now a, a 76er. Uh, but, again, like I mentioned, historical moment for his career as well. But that's going to do it. Episode 197, next Tuesday, and of course the following three weeks, we're going to have power forwards, centers, and then we're going to talk about the top 50 players in the NBA today. Should be tons of fun, and I'm, I'm sure uh, nobody will agree with the majority of those rankings. But this Thursday, we're going to be talking about Super Bowl 59 matchups we want to see. We have a new format, and of course some new graphics for you guys, so I'm excited to see what you guys think about that. But outside of that, of course, uh, we're debuting a new fantasy football channel, which I'll talk about soon, uh, this upcoming week. And then, of course, also we have our fantasy football content on this channel as well that isn't going anywhere. So if you enjoyed, drop a like, subscribe to the channel. We're on the road to 20K. And if you're on vacation or if you're having certain parties coming up this summer, of course, just stay safe. <laughs> but until Thursday, stay happy, stay healthy, get out of here.